Thank you, John. Thank you. Let me begin by reading uh, my abstract to set the stage for my presentation. My paper is on the challenges of failed or fractured states and the responsibilities and capacities of international institutions in addressing them. Failed states not only produce enormous humanitarian suffering, but also propel waves of refugees that represent a key source of instability in the world today. Using South Sudan as an illuminating case study, I will explore the role of transnational advocacy in the creation of the world's newest nation, its subsequent descent into civil war, tribal conflict, institutional collapse and famine, and international efforts to negotiate an end to the civil war and rebuild the fabric of a sustainable nation state. Among the recommendations for restoring peace and facilitating development in South Sudan is the idea of an international trusteeship, which recognizes that existing parties to the conflict lack the capacity for a negotiated settlement. Do international organizations, such as the United Nations or the African Union, have the will and capacity to assume such trusteeship? What lessons does the example of South Sudan offer to other cases of state fracture or failure? such as Syria, Somalia, and Lemon, Yemen. Can international institutions be strengthened or restructured to intervene when states fail? What are the minimal requirements for success of a nation state? I will address these questions, and I address them in my paper. I want to state at the outset that this paper is very preliminary, and I present at the end a recommendation for what would have been the ideal solution, but I have no clue as to whether this is feasible today or even if it is advisable today. So I present, in a sense, the problem, not the solution. As background, I have conducted periodic research on South Sudan for nearly two decades. I documented the transnational advocacy that created South Sudan, conducted field research there during its fragile independence, and I continue to monitor developments of the civil conflict and remain in contact with NGO officials in the region who struggled to contain the, the chaos. So my title is State Failure and International Response, The Lessons of South Sudan. This is a great challenge of the 21st century, state failure. The international system is still based on sovereign nations, but that Westphalian system is breaking down. The world is awash with refugees from failed states, fractured states, repressive states, corrupt states, lawless states. And one response, particularly from the Holy Father, is to open our hearts and borders. And while that is a trenchant and appropriate theological response, personally, it does not address the root of the challenge, which is the failure of states and the lack of international mechanisms to, do, to address them. And I'm going to use Sudan, South Sudan as my case study. So the question is, what responsibility and or capacity does the international community have to address this challenge? We do have the United Nations, international covenants, regional bodies, uh, international norms, but these are in fact inadequate to the challenge of failed or fractured states. One of the key frameworks, as many of you know, is the, is the responsibility to protect. Uh, and it's three norms, or three pillars rather. Uh, there is the global norm, that every state must protect its population from mass atrocity crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing. The second pillar is the international community must encourage, and states must encourage, the development, a capacity building uh, of law and international institutions and civil society and so forth to strengthen the potential for peace and stability. And then, of course, the third and most challenging is the concept that in the international community must intervene if a state fails to protect its own population, either through lack of capacity or, or from abuse. Uh, and it does envision, but only as a last resort, a military invention, which requires authorization by the UN Security Council. But it also suggests that regional bodies can play a role, as NATO did with Kosovo. There are, of course, critiques of R2P. And it's, it's fascinating how a concept has become uh, it, it becomes a catchword that we can abbreviate responsibility to protect an R2P. Um, it's good, it's a terrific concept at norm creating, but it still remains somewhat thin on concrete action. It, and it still is anchored 
in the idea of sovereign nations, and so it lacks an organizing mechanism to deal with literally failed states. It assumes UN Security Council action, but of course we've seen a, a kind of retrenchment from humanitarian intervention, a international fatigue um, with these kinds of issues. Richard Haas, the president of the Council of Foreign Relations of the United States, in his book, The World in Disarray, suggests that we need to strengthen R2P with a new norm, which he calls sovereign obligations in addition to sovereign rights, that the great emendation of the Westphalian system of sovereign rights or nations with sovereign rights is that nations have sovereign obligations. This has not been, and he did not instantiate this in clear mechanisms of international order. So let me address South Sudan and my claim that it in fact is a failed state. It's now Africa's worst, it has Africa's worst refugee crisis since the Rwandan genocide. Nearly 400,000 people have been killed in civil war deaths since 2013. A third of the population has been uprooted out of 12 million people. Two million are internally displaced, over two million external refugees which are destabilizing surrounding countries. Over half of the population is food insecure, million and a half on the brink of starvation, only sustained, in a sense, by dramatic and vast international support. Uh, a billion a year from the World Food Program, at least another billion from other organizations. But this, to me, is one of the most telling statistics, that it is the highest proportion of out-of-school children in the world that it is a state that is virtually collapsed. There is, the, the economy is collab has collapsed, the state has collapsed. There is virtually almost no infrastructure of government, governance in this country. And in a sense, South Sudan pre presents, you might say, a pure case. It does not have vast geo geopolitical implications that have stymied intervention like Syria or Afghanistan. Uh, it does not reflect the abuse of ethnic cleansing of a dominant a state against its minority, as in Miramar. It is just a failed state internally. And that in, makes it, a, in a sense, a good case study for my investigation. Uh, this is, of course, South Sudan, which split off from Sudan in 2011. So it has is, is, is only been in existence since 2011. And I visited the capital of Juba, Juba in, 19, in 2013, just on the eve of the Civil War. Now there is, that you want to understand why Sudan, South Sudan is the world's newest nation, you, understand, you need to understand the deeper roots of the conflict. And so Sudan, Sudan, like many African countries, had artificial boundaries set up by colonial powers. And there was a deep fissure in society um, based upon the domination of the country by uh, the Arab um, Islamic North versus the African animus Christian South. A core periphery issue where Khartoum uh, and the politics of the North dominated the more pastoral people of the South. Uh, after independence, uh, Sudan went through two civil wars uh, in 1955 to 72 and then in 1983 to 2005. The most devastating dimension of that second civil war was a religious dimension. Um, Khartoum was taken over by the Bashir government in 1989, which attempted to impose a Isla radical Islamist agenda on the entire country. This resulted in uh, a, a, a forced Islamization and Arabization by Khartoum, which resulted in massive religious and ethnic cleansing, and literally an attempt to eradicate the Christian presence in South Sudan. The same regime in a sense that gave refuge to Osama bin Laden, uh, exercised this uh, campaign against the African and Christian animus population. So, especially since 19, starting in 1989, uh, Sudan used a scorched earth campaign against the people of the South. It was, for many years, Africa's forgotten a war until it was engaged by indigenous bishops and pastors, Anglican, Catholic, Presbyterian, and others, uh, as well as Western Christian, Jewish, and human rights groups. That civil war resulted in two million deaths, five million displaced, and thousands enslaved, because Khartoum sort of reignited as a tool of war the enslavement of Africans, the abduction of Africans into slavery. 
Um, this led the Holocaust Museum Committee of Conscience to issue a genocide alert uh, in 2000, I believe it was. Now, it was because the advocacy community in the United States and Europe, UK, Christians, Jewish organizations, human rights organizations, anti-slavery organizations engaged this issue uh, that we can say, and I do say in my book, Freeing God's Children, in a chapter on the creation of South Sudan, that this was a nation born of international advocacy. And in that sense, I believe the advocacy community and the Western nations have a responsibility because they were uh, pivotal in the creation of this new nation. And what I document in the book is a tremendous wide array of alliances uh, that were mobilized for global religious freedom and then turned to the issue of South Sudan. Uh, and this was a genuine broad-based movement uh, with uh, initiatives, strategy meetings, demonstrations, uh, and so forth that I document in the book. And what I noticed about this campaign, it, it really was 1998, 99, 2000, 2001, 2002, uh, it involved one of the broadest alliances I've ever seen in Washington, D.C., be conserva between conservative evangelical organizations and Jewish groups, the Catholic Church and the liberal congressional black caucus, anti-slavery cham champions and secular human rights groups, and, uh, and policy makings, makers across the ideological and partisan spectrum. Uh, and so it was genuinely bipartisan, genuinely ecumenical, and it was uh, a tremendous initiative. And in a sense, that's why I say if there's a responsibility to protect the US government and the advocates involved have a responsibility. Uh, this is an example of one of the campaigns. It was controversial, but there were thousands of South Sudanese who were abducted into slavery, and John Eibner of Christian Solidarity International actually went into the African bush and, and purchased the freedom of those slaves, and he brought members of the Congressional Black Caucus and Jewish groups, and you can imagine uh, how this was so powerful. Uh, and ultimately, the, the pressure he created led to the manumission of a number of ex-slaves. Uh, this is an example of the ecumenical nature. Uh, senator Brownback, conservative Republican senator from Kansas, was one of the leaders of the campaign on behalf of South Sudan with many of the lost boys of Sudan, these former slaves, exiles, uh, as part of his campaign. He's now the ambassador for international religious freedom in the US State Department. And this is an example, again, of the wide array of alliances. These are some of the lost boys who were at the bill signing ceremony of the Sudan Peace Act in 2002. Uh, the tallest young man is, um, <coughs> uh, was held in slavery. Um, Francis Bach, uh, who was held in slavery for 10 years, then escaped, made his way to Egypt, ultimately to the United States. And he would speak to Jewish synagogues and, uh, and uh, Christian parishes and speak about coming to help set his people free. Uh, and it was said, perhaps, that he and the others were some of the first, were the last, were, uh, uh, that the last time an ex-slave was in the White House was Frederick Douglass with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, so it created a, a powerful moving um, uh, kind of thing, as you can imagine. So American leadership and the activism with UK and American figures like Baroness Cox of the House of Lords really led to the birth of this new nation. So following the Sudan, Sudan Peace Act, the, which George Bush signed, American pressures induced Khartoum to negotiate with the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, the army. And in 2005, the Khartoum regime signed a comprehensive peace agreement between the government and the SPLM, the rebel movement. And then in January of 2011, a referendum was held for independence uh, and a remarkable display at the time of, of unity and peace that was, helped, was facilitated by Catholic Relief Services and a nun who held 101 days of prayer before the vote to make sure that tribal tensions and ethnic tensions would not result and violence during the vote. And what makes this case so poignant to many of us is that the strength of religious civil society, it's the, it's the one strength in South Sudan that has existed uh, during the, the first war and during the civil war, that because Christianity was identified with resistance, 
uh, it has tr tremendous cachet, tremendous um, um, credibility in South Sudan. Uh, the, it's probably the demographic minority, although many Africans combine kind of tradi traditional African practices with Christianity. But Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, these are the major church communities in South Sudan. And one of the developments that I think is most notable uh, and still is a resource for the future if it could be used is the South Sudan Council of Churches. Um, when, uh, when basically the Civil War took place and the South was breaking away from Khartoum, the churches formed new, the, what was called the New Sudan Ch Council of Churches. And what's remarkable about this is this included a communities that are Protestant communities that are part of the World Council of Churches, the Anglicans, Presbyterians, Lutherans, and so forth, along with Catholics and Orthodox. Coptics and others. So it literally was the alliance of all of the Christian churches in South Sudan. Uh, I think it's unique in the world. And this group represented a potential check on government. They often criticized the Southern, uh, the, the Sudan uh, People's Liberation Army. Uh, they've been pivotal for peace negotiations, but they've been sidelined by the civil war that I'll talk about. This is an example of the, of the way Christianity is just a, deeply a part of this African nation uh, mass uh, in, uh, on Good Friday. Um, and then when I was there, this is the Catholic Cathedral in Juba. Interesting thing about that is they have an Arabic mass, because Arabic is still the, the predominant language in the South, although English is now the official language. Uh, so there'd be an Arabic mass, and then they would leave, and there'd be an English mass. Um, and so interestingly, when we say the kiss of peace, it's salam alaikum. Um, and so, and this is then the, um, the Episcopal Cathedral in Juba. And you see large, vibrant Christian communities. Uh, and this is true throughout the country, as I learned in talking with priests, bishops, religious leaders, and so forth. So there's a, and there was also, in addition, from, from the, the days of, this, of the uh, uh, struggle against Khartoum and for independence, and then during that fragile time from 2005 to 2013, when South Sudan enjoyed some modicum of peace, um, all of the great Christian NGOs were there. In fact, they were the principal organizations providing social services in the country. Uh, Catholic Relief Services, Caritas, World Vision, uh, et cetera. But the other, th and so this is an example. Uh, this is uh, a plaque for the Catholic Relief, Relief Services uh, with uh, Archbishop Paulino and Ken Hackett uh, signing a kind of an agreement for the, uh, the Catholic presence, the Catholic NGO presence in South Sudan. And this is an example of the kind of thing that they did. This is an example of sort of R2P, Pillar two, trying to provide a way to forestall conflicts. So if there are tribal tensions erupting in one part of the country, Catholic Relief Services was providing uh, uh, communications equipment so that those could be communicated and dealt with. Uh, and this is an example of uh, a signing agreement. This is 2013, unfortunately, just on the eve of the Civil War uh, between Catholic Relief Services and uh, Sudanese officials. But independence, sadly, was not enough um, because South Sudan was absolutely bereft of infrastructure. It's a country larger than France with maybe 50 miles of paved roads with a large part of the country inaccessible during the rainy season, a pastoral people spread about uh, in, the, in the bush. Um, it's a country where you don't see the state except for military garrisons. When I was there, I saw compounds of all of the NGOs, United Nations, um, NGOs and so forth, but no state, no central utilities, uh, no state function. Uh, it, it lacks an economy, it lacks civilian leadership. In fact, there was a failed transition from rebel commanders to civilian leaders. Education, they've lost almost an entire generation to war between 1983 to 2005 and then 2013 to the present. Uh, there's, there was no real good reconciliation process to overcome past wounds. There are deep tribal, tribal and ethnic divisions. And so as I describe it, sadly, 
this, this, this um, new country that was celebrated by Western advocates and by the people of South Sudan was a stillborn state. It's a country in name only. This is the capital city. This is, most of the streets in the capital city are this. No central utilities, no electrical system, no water system, just independent you, you know, um, uh, generators and so forth. Now, South Sudan had the potential. Um, there was one leader who was the founder, this is John Garang, you can't read, you don't need to read the, uh, the details here. Uh, but John Garang uh, was the founder and leader of the Southern People's Liberation Army slash movement. Um, and he was actually a prominent figure in the Sudanese military um, and highly educated. He got a bachelor's degree in the United States. He went on to get uh, master's and doctorate degrees from, the, from Iowa State University in agricultural economics. He spoke frequently in the United States. As a, as a leader in the, car, in the Sudan military, he actually studied at Fort Benning, Georgia. So here's a man who was highly educated, actually had both military and civilian experience, um, and ushered in, now he was accused of being a brutal commander of the SPLA like many, but he actually had the potential to perhaps midwife a genuine functioning state. But just three, month, three weeks after the signing of a comprehensive peace agreement between Khartoum and the SPLA, he was killed in a, in a helicopter accident, which was the terrible bad luck. Is no one else had his stature. And in his place um, was this man, Salva Kiir, who was his vice president. By the way, whenever you see photographs of Salva Kiir, he always wears a black cowboy hat because it was given to him by George Bush. Um, and I say there was a bit of naivete on the part of American Christians and other advocates that somehow Salva Kiir, as the successor to John Garang, had the capacity to govern. But in fact, his entire experience has be, had been as a militia, military commander, uh, guerrilla commander in the Sudanese bush. No higher education, just military experience. And he was, has been described to me by a number of NGO leaders out of his depth and really dominated by kind of, he was a member of the Dinka ethnic community, dominated by those who wanted to assert Dinka power over the rest of the country. These are the two competitors who have led to the Civil War. Uh, Salva Kiir and Riyak Machar, who's the, who was the vice president. And in effect, these have been the two rivals that have led to Civil War starting at the, in December of 2013. Uh, Kiir represents the Dinka, the largest ethnic tribe community. Salva Kiir, uh, uh, Riyak Machar represents the Nuer. And there are other, some 60 ethnic communities, but these are the two largest. So this is the image of Riyak Machar and Salva Kiir, but this might be a more accurate depiction of who they actually are and how they operate uh, in South Sudan. Uh, the officials I've talked with basically say that, that, that neither of them actually has the capacity to unite the country or govern. Um, and both have been accused uh, of leading militias in tremendous atrocities uh, during the Civil War. So the Civil War, so Sudan, South Sudan, uh, had a comprehensive peace agreement in 2005, and then in um, uh, 2011 declared independence. And between 2005 and 2013, while there was lots of uh, strife in the countryside and tribal uh, eruption of some tribal violence, nonetheless, it enjoyed some modicum of peace. That broke down uh, in 2013 as uh, basically uh, soldiers loyal to Raik Machar and, uh, and Salva Kiir uh, engaged in a firefight and it spread throughout the country. Uh, and various nations, the, 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 the Troika of the US, uh, UK and Norway pressed the parties to uh, reach agreements and they had periodic uh, peace treaties that always broke down. Um, and as an example of Salva Kiir's lack of sort of governing capacity, he actually engaged in creating from 10 states to 28 to 32 states in order to basically gerrymander Dinka power. So he became de facto uh, a leader of uh, sort of a Dinka faction of the country. Now in September of 2018, 
a peace accord was reached. Violence has stemmed somewhat, but key civil society actors like the Sudan Council of Churches have been shut out, um, and that and they're really stalling in um, in leading to the full implementation in May. So once the civil war broke out, there was devastating devastation across the countryside. Neither the government forces nor, nor the opposition forces operated like true armies. They all operated as if they were militias in the bush and they would attack villages, slaughter people, um, mass rapes were endemic. Um, as you can see, a Doctors Without Borders facility destroyed massive refugees fleeing out. So there's been a huge struggle to kind of protect this fragile or fracturing or failed state. The Troika of the US, UK, and Norway have pressed repeatedly for ceasefires and security guarantees. The African Union and IGAD, which is the Six Nations of the African Horn, have hosted actual mediation sessions. Uh, UN Blue Helmets are protecting some aid corridors, the World Food Program, USAID, et cetera, are trying to get aid to the population, which is on life support and NGOs have struggled to do peacekeeping and so forth. But the problem is, we have stakeholders without national capacities or stakes or capacities. There's been vast corruption. So all of these commanders, SPLA commanders, have basically become multimillionaires, skimming literally almost over a billion dollars probably in oil revenue and aid revenue. And these commanders live in fabulous compounds and have homes in Nairobi and elsewhere, and actually then lead and provide money and guns and liquor to teenagers who fight for them. But they actually don't suffer for the Hobbesian nightmare they're creating. And I, I was told by uh, uh, one official that um, huge delegations would go to five-star hotels in Arusha or in Nairobi for these negotiations, and they would party together by prostitutes and so forth while their teenage militias are killing each other and, and, and raping and pillaging. So they, 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 they don't actually have the stakes um, uh, uh, to, uh, to make something happen. And, um, and I say here that you know the leadership did not overcome the ethnic and tribal divisions. They didn't have that. Uh, Kier actually violated what I call Machiavelli's central rule, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. So he fired the vice president, his chief rival, uh, which made him independent and in effect of the leaders of the Nuer. So we have here a failed state, a state with a collapsing, eco no economy, no infrastructure, no governing capacity, basically leaders who are leaders of ethnic militias, a country on li international life support, and in an ideal world, what would have happened would have been some kind of trusteeship. In a report to the Council on Foreign Relations, um, Kate Omquist Knopf said basically we need, this was 2016, she said we need a clean break from all of the antagonists. Riek Machar, Salva Kiir, their lieutenants, they're incapable of governing. Uh, we need a complete break. Um, we need an international transition administration. We need a negotiated exit for both of these leaders, and then a time to midwife, to nurture and draw upon the strengths of civil society, the churches, the young people, the uh, Sudanese, Sudanese exiles, to actually create then the conditions for a governing country, and to have mass education to prepare citizens for governing. So in an ideal world, that's what would have happened. But in a sense, that didn't happen. In part because we don't really have structures. This notion of a trusteeship was back basically kind of an, uh, in, you know, envisioned at, at the time of the United Nations to ease colonies into independent status. We've had examples of how those have worked. In some cases, the, the problem has been putting foreign troops into these countries, which has led to sex trafficking. So you'd need much better discipline. But there really isn't a mechanism for saying, we have a failed state. We need to have a transitional authority. Who's going to do it? Who's going to enforce it? Well, this has led a remarkable personal diplomatic initiative by the Holy Father. In April 13th, on the eve of Holy Week, Pope Francis invited Riek Machar, Salva Kiir, and their lieutenants to come to the Vatican. And in a dramatic gesture, 
he kissed their feet. And right, um, Savakir said he trembled. He is Catholic. Rik Mashar is Presbyterian. So in a sense, this was a remarkable gest gesture. And we can pray and we can hope that this will actually result uh, in some resolution. But here's the problem. The whole enterprise still assumes sovereignty. It still is treating these two men as if they are potentially the leaders of a new nation, when in fact, all the evidence suggests that they're not. So, so the ideal would have been for the international community to say, rather than please negotiate a peace, it would have been please step down and allow your country to recover. And so I end with this plea, in a sense a cri de coeur, a cry of the heart from the people of South Sudan, from the NGO leaders who were there. Um, don't abandon the people of South Sudan. And in fact, when I was on the phone uh, just before I came here with the leader of Catholic Re Relief Services, which has 700 people in the country and is doing peacemaking and development work, I said I was going to be speaking to the Vatican. And he became very animated. And he said, I have two messages for you. First, to the Holy Father. Gracias. <laughs> Thank you for your gesture. But also, please, Holy See, Holy Father, please appeal to the powerful countries in the United States, the UK, um, the Norway, uh, and, and the African Union and others. Please tell them, don't abandon South Sudan. In our frustration, in the American government's frustration, and UK's, our chaos, our retrenchment, UK's chaos, um, there's a sense of wanting to just abandon it. He said, please tell the leaders of these countries don't abandon the people of South Sudan. And that is my message. Thank you.